God is love that love surrounds me in the love I safely dwell. Tis above beneath within me. Love is mine and all is well. God is love, sweet love. God is love, pure love, that love is mine, mine and all is well. God is peace, that peace surrounds me, in that peace I safely dwell, tis above. Greetings to the Church of God. Amen. Indeed, God is love. Our message for this hour is entitled Think About the Children. And I want to begin by reading a beautiful verse in the Bible that is said read. Psalm 144 verse 12 That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth That our daughters may be as pillars sculptured in palace style Let us pray Our Lord and our Father what a privilege it is for us to be in your presence again this evening, to listen to you as you speak to us. Lord, we need the presence 
of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will draw us closer to you, help us understand precisely what you want us to get from this message. May you increase, Lord, as I decrease in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Think about the children or think of the children. The message in summary is this. One of the best ways of sheltering our children from harm and danger, from physical abuse, from drug and substance abuse, is to spend ample quality time with them. Children equate love with time. The more quality time you spend with them, the more they feel loved, the, the more they perceive to be loved. Most fathers, on the other hand, think that love for children means sending them to expensive schools, buying them expensive toys, state-of-the-art toys, very expensive smartphones, and throwing huge birthday parties for them. What a contrast in the perception of love between parents and children. Think of the children is a phrase that is often used and has sometimes been overused by those that advocate for children's rights. I was going through today's paper, there was an article at the Daily Times. There was an article entitled, Giving Children a Voice and a Helping Hand. In 1999, the then US President Bill Clinton used the phrase, think of the children, when he said in his speech to the International Labor Organization, think of the children free of crushing burden of dangerous and demeaning work, given those irreplaceable hours back of childhood for learning and playing and living. When we go to the Bible, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ showed great love and compassion for children. You read verses like Matthew 19, verse 14, Mark 10, verse 14, Luke 18, verses 16 and 17. And I want to go to the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 16 and 17. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. In the book of John, Jesus Christ addressed his disciples as children. In a passage dealing with the scarcity of time or shortness of time, when they would be with him, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verses 33 to 35, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The time had come for Jesus to announce his departure to his disciples. 
And he spoke so fondly with them, referring to them as little children. This is an expression of tender affection used nowhere else in the Gospels. And John did not forget the expression. And so he used it repeatedly in one of his letters, First John. When you read this verse, you get the sense that Jesus, out of love, wanted his disciples to make the best use of the little time that was available for them to spend with him. Efficient time management is crucial. It is one of the secrets of success in life. Time, it has been said, does not respect people. It marches on whether you are busy or asleep. And it has also been said that lost wealth may be gained by industry and the economy. Lost knowledge by study. Lost health by temperance. But lost time is gone forever. See them that you walk circumspectly, says Paul. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. To walk circumspectly is to step gingerly. To advance with great care and caution to avoid harming. We need to watch our path to avoid contact with undesirable influences. Redeeming the time means taking advantage of opportunities for service. We each have a limited amount of time on earth and Paul encourages us to use as much of that time as possible for the advancement of Christ's purposes in this world. One of our spiritual professors and generals says in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 342, paragraph 1, Our time belongs to God. Every moment is His. And we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. The value of time, he continues to say, is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious. And it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be tripled away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. We have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin. It is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life. It is now that we are to prepare for the searching judgment. And then listen to what she says next. The human family has scarcely begun to live when they begin to die. And the world's incessant labor ends in nothingness unless a true knowledge in regard to eternal life is gained. The man who appreciates time as his working day will fit himself for a mansion and for a life that is immortal. It is well that he was born. We are admonished to redeem the time because time squandered can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. The only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains. By being co-workers 
with God in his great plan of redemption. I will go is not just merely a slogan. It is something that underscores to us the importance of efficient time management to utilize the time that God has given us to his glory in serving him and our fellow human beings. The Bible gives us a case study in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 15. Here we find a man that was so popular, a man that was so busy, and yet this man had very little time for his children. When you read 2 Samuel chapter 15, you find King David, and at this time, he was just over 60 years old. But when you go through the narrative of 2 Samuel chapter 15, you will discover in this chapter that David looks older than his 60 plus years. His shoulders slump, his head hangs, he shuffles like a very old man. He struggles to place his foot in front of the other. He pauses often as he walks, partly because the hill is steep, and also partly because he needs to stop and weep. This is the longest path he has ever walked. Longer than the one from the Brookside to Goliath. Longer than the one from being a fugitive chased by King, King, King Saul to being the king in Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 15 verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went up. Then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray, take the counsel of Ahithophel in two foolishness. Now imagine the king in Israel, the then president of the nation of Israel, walking barefooted and weeping in public. His trusted men are with him. His cabinet is with him. And his cabinet ministers are weeping together with him. It must have been a serious crisis. But what was the cause of this crisis? It's been 14 years since David seduced Bathsheba. 13 years since Nathan the prophet had said to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 10, the sword shall never depart from your house. And the prophecy had come painfully true in his life. Amnon, one of his sons, had fallen in lust with his half-sister Tamar, a faint sickness. You know the story. Amnon ended up raping his half-sister. And when this thing had happened, David's reaction was that of anger and silence. He was very angry, the Bible says so. And then, when you would have expected him to take time to do something about it, David opted for silence. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19, 20, and 21. The Bible says, Then Tamar put 
ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. The Bible tells us that Tamar remained desolate in her brother's house. She remained isolated. She remained deserted and forsaken. She needed David's protection. She needed the father's affirmation and validation in this time of crisis and trauma. She needed a daddy during this crisis. What she got was silence and absence. Tamar was a girl without a father. Yes, David was alive. And he indeed was the biological father. But his silence and his absence meant the town was a girl without a father. There are many fathers that are there in the home and yet their sons and daughters are without fathers. Let's continue with the story of David. Absalom decided to do something about it. I'm sure every time he looked at his sister, it pained him. And so he decided he was going to do something about it since David had decided to be quiet. Second Samuel chapter 13 verse 23, the Bible tells us that it came to pass after two full years that Absalom organized a party of sheep shearers, those that were involved in the cutting of, of the hair or of, 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 of the wool of sheep at a place near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all king's sons. Now, Absalom was a smart person. He was very smart. It took him two years to execute his revenge. He waited till all seemed to be well. Father, 
used reverse psychology, which some educators say is strategic self and conformity, a tactic advocating for a behavior that is different from the desired outcome. So, when David finally said, no ways, I cannot come, I cannot join you, then Absalom took the next step and he said, all right then, please allow all of the king's sons to come and, 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 and celebrate with me. All of the king's sons, including Amnon. At that point, something clicked in the father's mind. And he asked the question, why do you want Amnon to join you? And he said, I just want all of the king's sons to join you. Finally, all of the king's sons joined Amnon at the festival. And then, they at the festival, substances were being shared. I think there were alcoholic substances there. Because the Bible describes something that happened. That when Amnon was married with wine, it was at that point that Absalom gave the sign that he had agreed with this man to, to be used as a symbol, as an indication to take action immediately. And so Amnon was killed two years after raping his half-sister. David got the news. What was his reaction? Obviously, as a father, he was deeply saddened. Mourned the death of Amnon and then silence again. Jezreelites. His second, Chiliab by 
Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, the maid Absalom, the son of Maka, the daughter of Tamai, king of Geshur, the fourth Adonijah, the son of Hagib, the fifth Shephatiah, the son of Abitai, and the sixth Ithrim by David's wife, Ekla. These were born to David in Hebron. How many wives are mentioned here? Six. six different children, six different mothers. For him, I, I, please don't be too judgmental on David. <laughs> At least he is publicly known. <laughs> Yours and mine. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> So we have six wives mentioned in this passage. And then you add Micah, Saul's daughter, and then you add Bathsheba, you get how many spouses? Eight. Too many to give each one a day each week. One day, one young husband approached his pastor and proudly told him that he had one wife at home and a lover in an apartment. This announcement to the pastor actually shocked him. He never expected a member of his congregation to come and face him that way and tell him such news. And so the pastor in disbelief just looked at him and seeing the confusion registered on the pastor's face the young husband said to the pastor are you surprised I have only two David had at least eight and he was a man after God's own heart he forgot that David was a man after God's own heart when he was following the ways of God. Amen? Amen? So please, let's understand. It's clear in the Bible. Yes, he was a man after God's own heart, but it was at a time when he was doing God's will. Now, how would you respond to a church mate who comes to you and says this and uses David's story to justify his infidelity. How would you respond? I think that one of the most appropriate responses would be to say to the church mate, please read on the story of David. It seems like you have just read half of it. Please continue and see what followed. Remember the story of Absalom. David finally reunited with him, but that was after five years of not seeing or talking to each other. And it was too late because by this time Absalom had plotted to take over his father's throne. A coup cool d'etat was about to be hushed. Hushed not by a stranger but by a member of the same household. Hence the story that we are looking at tonight. Hence this day for his life, his own son has staged a cool guitar. Second Samuel 15, verse 30. So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and went as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went up. David's loyalist 
trying to chase Absalom down. And when Absalom tries to escape on his horseback, his long hair tangles in a tree, and soldiers spear him to death. David hears the news, and he just breaks into pieces. Second Samuel 18, verse 33. Oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Are you serious, David? This is someone you refused to see for five solid years. Now that he is gone, you are saying you wish you had died in his place. How do we explain David's disastrous home? No time. He had no time for his sons and daughters. Many children today are suffering in silence. They are nursing terrible wounds, both psychological and mental wounds, physical as well sometimes. Being sexually abused but not getting the support of parents. Being introduced to drug and substance abuse. Some, strangely, are even being taught witchcraft and satanism right in the remnant church. Some of our children are being taught that they were born homosexuals. And they have bought into this teaching. But they can't do anything about their homosexual tendencies. We don't know it. We think all is well. And if the battles that our children are faced with are so huge, so enormous, that without our presence, without our presence in their lives, they cannot make it. One secular musician sang the song, Think About the Children. It was a popular song in the 90s. Some of you would remember it. Many knew this song as Born to Suffer. And the musician, well known and very popular in South Africa at that time, was lamenting over the plight of children. Who is going to tell them what is right if they are growing up without a father? A line in the song says, Born to suffer. And indeed, many children in this world have only been born to suffer. How do we regain the confidence of our children? Parents and guardians, how are we using our time? There is hope for our children. And there is hope for us. We can, by the grace of God, start afresh and redeem the time. Dr. James Dobson, very well-known family specialist in the USA and a popular author, writes about boys without a father. In his book entitled Bringing Up Boys, he says, while children of all ages have an innate need for contact with their fathers. Let me emphasize again that boys suffer from the absence or non-involvement of their fathers. According to the National Center for Children in Poverty, boys without fathers 
are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to go to jail, and nearly four times as likely to need treatment for emotional and behavioral problems compared to boys with fathers. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University found that children living in two parent families who had only a fair or poor relationship with their fathers were at 68% higher risk of smoking, drinking, and drug usage than teens having a good or excellent relationship with their dads. By comparison, children growing up in a home headed by a single man who had an excellent relationship with their mothers had 62% lower risk of abusing substances than children living in a two-parent family with a with fair or poor relationship with their father. The influence of a good father, says Dr. James Dobson, can hardly be overemphasized. Fathers, it's not enough just to be in the home supplying the needs. It's not enough. You need to have a good relationship with your sons. Nancy Van Pelt, another family life specialist, talks about girls without a father. And she says, some girls overdo it in the way they walk, the way they dress, and the way they talk. Most likely, such a person is proud for the male attention she never got at home. Her daddy was too busy, or maybe she never knew a real father because of divorce or separation, or even death. Studies of adolescent girls without fathers in the home have shown that teen girls behave differently around boys if they have not learned social skills from their fathers. In other words, writes Nancy Van Pelt, girls learn to get along with boys by getting along with their fathers. Girls whose parents had divorced were found to be more seductive and sometimes promiscuous. The researchers concluded that this resulted from the tension these young ladies felt in the presence of the opposite sex. Tension produced action, but instead of relating easily and openly to boys, the girls responded more impulsively. And then she cautions, she says, certainly no one should blame a girl for such behavior when circumstances beyond her control triggered it. But a young lady can learn where she is more vulnerable and why she acts, talks, and behaves the way she does. In fact, for all girls. Knowing yourself is more important than knowing more guys. She concludes. Earlier, I talked about time management as one of the secrets of success in life. As we spend time with our sons and daughters, let us also use our time to fulfill the Great Commission as recorded in Matthew chapter 28. Ellen White says, Now is our time to labor for the salvation of our fellow men. There are some who think that if they give money to the cause of Christ, this is 
all they are required to do. The precious time in which they might do personal service for him passes unimproved. But it is the privilege and duty of all who have health and strength to render to God active service. All are to labor in winning souls to Christ. Donations of money cannot take the place of this. This comes from Christ's object lessons, page 343, paragraph 1. Church of God, redeem the time and think about the children. Redeem the time spent on entertainment. Redeem the time spent on soccer. Man City versus Liverpool. Redeem the time spent on TV, soaps, and opera.
gracious Father, help us to slow down. Help us as parents and guardians and as concerned people to think about the children. Lord, sometimes in our praise for success in life, in our praise for money, in our praise for popularity and wealth, we set our priorities wrongly. Please forgive us. Help us, Lord, that we will do that which pleases you. That our youth, our sons may grow like plants in their youth. Our daughters like pillars sculptured in palace style. And in the resurrection morning or at your second coming, we may together with our children rejoice to see you. Bless us and keep us. But this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.